Good morning, everybody. You, you gotta love college football. It's crazy. I mean, we've had two games that came down to the, the last drive. Uh, other than that, we've, we've beaten teams pretty soundly, uh, except for the App State game. So App State came to the end and we won the game, and, and we, we haven't been successful the last two weeks. But it shows you the parity that's out there in college football. I put up scores every Sunday for our players and, and just see the shocks that happen in college football across the country. And um, it's, it's, we have to educate ourselves because it is what it is. And I do think the transfer portals probably made, made it where everybody's got some really good players. And, and everybody can, if, they, if they're struggling some, um, they can get good players like we did uh, to be a better team the next year. And, and the transfer portal is not going away. Because it's, uh, everybody's got a quarterback. I, th I thought uh, uh, King played great Saturday night. He hadn't played that well. He, did. he struggled the week before against Boston College, but he played well. But Georgia Tech uh, um, beat Miami at Miami. Uh, so they're obviously a, a really good team. They've got the fastest receivers that will play probably this year. And we had trouble tackling them in space, and, and then uh, they ran the ball on us in the second half. So uh, we've got uh, um, exciting finish to the season. Uh, we, you start looking at we've got what would be considered three rival games, one here with Duke, and, and at Clemson's hard to play, and, and Duke's playing great, and then at State's hard to play. Uh, so we've got our hands full. Um, we'll have to get ready to go against uh, uh, Campbell this weekend at home. Only have two home games left for these seniors who have given us a lot of joy over the last few years. So we want the fans to come out and thank them. And, and uh, we do think this will be the, the last two games Drake will play at home. Uh, and he played great Saturday night. So uh, we're sitting here at six and two and, and we're probably two dra drives away from being a top 10 team. And that's how close we are to, to being a great team. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it. We had a, a, a really good start. Um, and, and last week against Virginia, we didn't, so that was one of the keys. Uh, and we had a great first quarter. Um, continued to do the same the second quarter offensively and, and then gave up too many big pass plays in the, the second quarter defensively. Uh, came back out the third quarter, maybe the best third quarter we've played. Offensively, we only scored seven points, but we kept the ball um, all but one minute. Uh, defense intercepted a pass on the, the first drive after a block punt for us that saved us, and then defense had a three and out. And um, so you're going into the fourth quarter with a, an 11 point lead. Like last week, we had a 10 point lead against uh, Virginia. Um, and unlike what we've done the previous four years, uh, we have played well in the fourth quarters. We have not played well this year in the fourth quarter. We've scored 33 points and given up 56. And you ask why, I don't know why. We're, we're looking at conditioning, we're looking at our practice schedules, we're looking at everything, because you gotta win in fourth quarters. And, and we played better in the fourth quarter against App State, uh, obviously, than last year, but Saturday night's fourth quarter defensively was unacceptable. And it was more like the, the fourth quarter defense against uh, App State last year and, and cost us the game. Uh, so we've gotta, we, we have to finish games better. Uh, offensively, you rushed for 267 yards, 5.7 yards per carry. Uh, Drake throws for 310 yards, two touchdowns, and runs for a touchdown. You score five touchdowns in your five trips to the red zone. You're 9 of 15 on third down. Um, <clears throat> those are all the positive things. Still too many penalties. We've got to get rid of the holding penalties. Uh, whether they're holding or not, they call them, and it, it puts us in a tough spot cost us an opportunity to score at the end of the game again. Um, so we, we've got to eliminate offensive penalties and most of them are offensive uh, penalties. Um, and the other thing we've got to do that we just haven't done, we've got to score. When we're behind the fourth quarter, we had two opportunities to score against Virginia and didn't. Um, and as good as our offense was in the game, you got to win the game. And then the same thing Saturday night, we had two opportunities to, to score. We missed field goal on one. Um, where the guys not missed a field goal all year, and then the, the other one, we fumbled. Uh, and got a first down and had a holding penalty to call it back um, on the field goal drive. So um, um, offensively, we can still get better. We can still do things better and, and score when we've got opportunities to win games at the end, which we did last year. 
our team wasn't as good last year, but we, we won a lot of close games, and, and we haven't done that uh, in, in the last two weeks. Defensively, the, uh, we're just inconsistent. Until we stop the run better than we have the last two weeks, um, we're not going to win here at the end. All these teams run the ball good, and now everybody's just going to line up and run the ball. And I don't know why we were playing good defense early and why we were stopping the run early and why we're not now. And Gene will be here in a minute. You can ask him. Ask him why he thinks it's a problem and what he thinks we're going to do about it. Because until we stop the run better, uh, we're not going to win another game. Period. You can't give up that many rushing yards. That's, that's football. Um, and I gave the staff a quote from Coach Bowden this morning. Don't keep practicing things that aren't working. Um, why aren't we stopping the run? And, and we have to. Uh, that's, uh, that's basic football. Period. Uh, and why are we so inconsistent? Why don't we play a great first quarter and a great third quarter and then stink in, in the second and fourth? I don't know. Those are things we've, we've got to get answered. Um, and we've got to make sure it's, I love these players. They tried hard. They had a great week's practice. They were ready to play. Um, so it's, it's on us as coaches to put them in the right positions and, and uh, give them opportunities to win. Uh, so I, I never ever blame it on, on players. And I do think that like everybody else in the country, Georgia Tech had the same problem. We're having trouble with tempo. Uh, it's, it's eliminating calls and it, it's uh, um, eliminating substitutions. And when you get a long drive, people get tired and you can't substitute. So tempo is the biggest change in college football uh, for defenses across the country. And it's, it's hurting defenses uh, more than ever. And here's a defense that had two fourth down stops uh, that were unbelievable at the first of the game. Had an interception to start the second uh, half of the third quarter. So they did some really good things until the fourth quarter where we absolutely could not stop the run. And it, and it cost us the game. Uh, special teams, uh, the, the good things are Liam Boyd was back and he kicked all the kicks out of the end zone. So they didn't have a chance to return a kickoff. Uh, Doc Chapman uh, stood up on, on offense. and and caught a touchdown pass, so good for him. He's worked really, really hard to get that opportunity, but he also had a really good kickoff return and, and put us in a position to, to stay in the game at a critical time. Uh, so really, really proud of, of Doc and, and Liam Boyd. Uh, missed the field goal, like we said, and now we've had a, a, another block punt. It's been somebody different uh, every time, but the same scheme, so I've told them we've got to look at changing some things. Uh, we had the right people there, but our shield um, twice, uh, three times, two times they reached over and this time they ran around it behind. Uh, so you got to get the ball off uh, on time, but you also have to do a better job with the shield. Uh, so we've got to, to improve in that area. And I uh, also want to brag on William Barnes. I mean, Omari played great. He had one of the best runs I've ever seen where we didn't block anybody on the goal line and, and he broke a bunch of tackles and scored. Uh, he's a special player. And, uh, we got to keep getting him the ball. So, so proud of him. Proud of the offensive line. We, we've got to eliminate the holding penalties, but they, they protected Drake well, and, and they also uh, were running the ball really well uh, for the last two weeks. So uh, they're, they're doing a good job with what they need to do, and the tight ends as, as well. Uh, all, all of it's about stopping the run. we got to stop the run to get better, and that's been a problem around here for five years. And like I said, we... We improved in that area against some really good running teams. Miami ran the ball really well, but we haven't done well with it since the Miami game. Um, Campbell is Military Appreciation Week, and glad we'll uh, be back home after fall break for all of our fans to, to pull for our team the last two weeks. Uh, Mike uh, Mendert's a coach, and he was a great player for the Panthers, and uh, I remember him as an outstanding safety at Nebraska. Um, and he's done a tremendous job there. He's been there 10 years. He's taken a lot of transfers, and that's what's happened now with uh, whoever you play. You're seeing new players show up. They got guys starting from FSU, LSU that we recruited. <coughs> Their nose tackles from Illinois, an offensive tackle uh, or guard from UCLA, offensive tackle starting from Wake Forest. They got guys from NC State. Um, they've got uh, transfers all over the place, and that, that changes the dynamic. Uh, their best players are quarterback Haj Malik Williams, 37 career starts all-time passer in yards and touchdowns in their school history. He's completing 74% of his passes, which is second uh, in the FCS. So he's done a really good job 
but if, if I'm them, I come in and try to run the ball because uh, until we stop that, like I said, we're not going to win another game. Uh, questions? Mac, you mentioned uh, how the transfer portal is equalized a lot in college football. You guys have players from FCS schools like Elijah Huzzy. Do you feel like this is probably the best FCS has been since, or former Division I AA has been that you've seen in college football? Yeah, I think so. Everybody's just trading players. And everybody's getting good players. And you've got to give Mike um, so much credit for getting those transfers. How's he get a lot of them from UCLA? And I can understand NC State and Wake Forest. Um, linebacker from LSU was very highly recruited. We, we recruited and he, he wouldn't visit. And then uh, George Wilson was a great defensive end from Virginia Beach and he went to Florida State. And he's their best pass rusher, or one of their best pass rushers. So they've, they've done a really good job with the transfer portal. Mm -hmm. Matt, uh, looking at the, looking at the, uh, the fourth quarter, I mean, you mentioned tempo. I mean, was it just a case of your defensive line just getting worn down? I feel like their offensive line did a good job as the game went on, especially. Yeah, I, I think so. Gene will address all that chip here in a minute. But, I mean, we're, we are can't get them off the field. And they blocked us, and we didn't respond very well. So that was very, very disappointing. I do want to brag on Seth Gray. It's his birthday today. And he's one of the best kids I've ever seen and one of the best leaders I've ever seen, and, and he'll, he'll help us get it straightened out. Is there a trigger point to – is there a moment maybe where you sense that some of this stuff that was working defensively earlier, just for lack of a better term, kind of fell over a cliff? Uh, I, I wouldn't – so I'm, I'm trying to find a good way to say yeah, it. But, the but good way to say then, it is we were playing great defense before the Virginia game, and we have played very poor defense the last two weeks. So if, 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 if falling off the cliff is a better term for you, uh, I was, dramatic, that, that's, well, it's I don't know if it's my term so much. I was just trying to find a way to. Yeah, here, here's what. It's been pretty dramatic. Yeah, here, here's what you don't hear. We played great defense the first quarter. Wow, we didn't fall off the cliff the first quarter. We played maybe the best defense we've played in a long time in the third quarter. Didn't fall off the cliff the third quarter. So you all want it to be drastic. The fourth quarter, we were absolutely awful, as bad as we've been since we've been here. So to me, you look at what's good about first and third quarter, and you try to figure out, like Chip said, what happened. Uh, second, they threw it. Fourth, they ran it. And why? And part of that's offensively. We didn't play as well on offense in the fourth quarter, so we, we were 0-3 on third downs. So if we stay on the field offensively, and, and that's why this stuff gets pretty complicated. It's not as simple as everybody wants it to be. This much stump, no, it's a team game, and we start talking about complementary football. When you can't move the ball, you leave your defense out there too long, they're going to get tired. Staying on that, you you mentioned going back to even after Pittsburgh when you had to settle for field goals, the Syracuse had to settle for field goals late. You kind of saw some of these issues before they led to losses. How what has been the problem not being able to score touchdowns in the fourth quarter? I think the other night was the first one since Minnesota. Yeah, I, I don't know. Some of it we've been slowing the game down. We were ahead in most of those games, so that's most of it, and and that's. Uh, excuse those numbers. So Saturday night we didn't score much, and they scored a bunch, and that's the problem. Mike, as you've gone back and looked at it, um, it looked like at least their Saturday night to, to some of our untrained eyes, it looked like Georgia Tech threw it on you pretty well in the first half, and you adjusted, maybe you got a nickel in the second half, and then stayed in the nickel when they were running it all over you. I mean, did you? That that's, seemed like one of the failures. That's too. what Gene will be here to answer. Did that, you all see that when you went back and looked at it? That that's what Gene will be here to answer. That's why we have our coordinators come for 30 minutes. Is there anything that you can share as far as the conversations that you've had with Gene since, uh, since the Georgia Tech game or over the past two weeks with the defensive struggles? That they're what you figure. I mean, they're not good. Um, and, and the confusing thing is, when you lose, everybody's negative about everything. That's just my 47 years in this business. When you win, people don't even talk about the negative things that happen because they're so excited about winning. They let a lot of stuff slide. So my job is to make sure I look at what the problems are and how to fix them. I look at what we do well and see how we can improve those. 
everybody is griping about the defense, and they should. Part of that's the offensive problem in the fourth quarter. We didn't move the ball. Nobody's talking about that. That's facts. Uh, so uh, I have to look at everything. So I've had the same conversations with the offense in a different way about, man, you, you, you were ahead and you, you didn't finish. As we do the defense about till you start stopping and running and tackling people, um, I would rather them, uh, Virginia threw for 495 yards around here three or four years ago, rushed for 21, and we won the game 59 to 38 or something. Um, you can't let people run the ball and, and you win games. I'd, still, I'd rather them throw for a bunch than run. But if they can run it, they can do both. And um, Georgia Tech did a good job. I asked him the other night how you were going to patch things together the next day, meaning yesterday. So what was yesterday like, and how did you approach it? I, I approached with the team exactly what I say to you. I told them we're, we're two drives away from being a top five team. That's how close we are. And at the same time, we were got awful in the fourth quarter on both sides of the ball. You can't give up that many rushing yards, but also stay on the field offensively and don't point fingers because all of us are at fault. And I said, love you guys. You practiced hard, you were ready to play. I didn't think we had the, I didn't think we matched Virginia's intensity. We matched Georgia Tech's intensity. They were ready to go, I love them. A lot of people would love to be six and two. I put up all the comparable teams across the country. I said, you've got the 13th toughest schedule in the, the country. You're tired, you're beat up, like everybody else is in college football. Uh, you got a chance to finish strong against really good teams. So get your head up, and let's, uh, they remember November. You didn't play well in November last year. Uh, so you got a chance to get your fans back. You got a chance to be real positive. Uh, but we got to be honest with each other and fix the things that, that are wrong. Hey, uh, going off of that a little bit, uh, kind of this point of the season, going from obviously top 10, being out in rankings, kind of falling down the ACC race as well. I know, I, you know every week players play to win, but how do you kind of keep guys engaged, you know, kind of at this point in the season with Things going yeah, six and two is one of the best seasons we've ever had around here at this point. If it's like last year, uh, it's the way you present it. Uh, starting six and zero, oh, two losses is dis discouraging. If you'd started zero oh and two and won six in a row, everybody would be pumped. Um, and a lot of people would swap with us right now. So I, I don't get into. I like this is good, this is bad, this is an awful season, this is a great season. You, you do that at the end of the year, uh, and we just got to keep playing. And then. Kind of being out of the rank is not to harp on it too much, but does that take a, I mean, is there a, this is a weird way of putting it, but there's, is there a positive to that? Does it take like a shine or a pressure away from kind of you guys as you, you know, go week to week? No, absolutely not. You'd always be, want to be ranked number one in the country. I mean, that's the pressure you want, so that's who we want to be. We've got to fight to get back in the rankings. And uh, like I said, they're not important till the end. We earned the tenth ranking, and we've lost that opportunity the last two weeks. So, and you got to win close games to have great seasons anymore. We, we if we'd lost a, uh, if we lost in overtime to App State, we're three and three. I mean, uh, five and three. Um, so, you, you can't take that stuff for granted. You got to winning's hard. You got to appreciate every win. And there's going to be some really good teams with three or four losses here at the end of the year. And that's going to start happening more and more. We're getting more like the NFL. NFL playoff teams can, can be 10 and 4. And they're excited. Uh, so that's kind of what's happening in college football. Matt, uh, sort of along the lines of what Jeremiah is asking you, I was thinking about it like, I mean, this is an older group of guys, uh, by and large, that have had very ambitious goals for this season. And with the back-to-back -back losses, some of those goals – you know, move, move further from reality. I mean, as part of your challenge, challenge this week, in addition to fixing stuff, just like the motivation, like like making sure the motivation doesn't dip or wane. You know what I'm saying? Like, is that part of your on your plate? Sure. But if you if you're trying to be the best you can be, and you're trying to improve every week, and you're trying to play up to a standard, none of that should matter. I mean, it's these are human beings, and obviously there's some disappointment for all of us. Uh, but they don't cancel the games, they don't cancel the season. Right. Uh, there's guys on our team that won two games one year. And there's fans that didn't show up for two games that are bitching about six wins. So, um, I, I mean, that, that's just part of the deal. You, you just do the best you can do. Trying to explain how 120 guys feel and 
if they're excited, if they're disappointed. Some that didn't play are mad because they didn't play. Uh, some that played good are really excited. Some that played bad are blaming coaches <laughs> across the country. That's just, that, that's what happens. It's a, uh, it's a, a huge uh, span of emotions when you start looking at a football team and, and you just have to kind of balance it all out and do the best you can do and try to get ready to uh, not only beat Campbell but get better uh, this week because you got uh, you got one of the hardest schedules left emotionally that we've ever had. Matt, you talked earlier in the year you prefer these like FCS games before the beginning of the season. I know hindsight's only 2020, but looking at it now, do you feel like this kind of game came at the perfect time for you guys considering what's happened? I don't know. Uh, you got to play good. One of the problems we've got this week is everybody will be talking about Duke and Clemson and State and not Campbell. And we've had a tendency around here to not play up to our best at times. So this is a, a great week for us to uh, to play to a standard. We played uh, Wofford a few years ago, and uh, I thought it was awful. They ran the ball on us. They kept the ball. I think we ended up winning 34 to 7 or something, and, and we didn't. What was the score? 34 14. 34 yeah, 14. And we didn't play well at all. We <coughs> played with emotion. Um, I thought they left happy and we left mad. So, uh, what you got to do is you got to play. We, we got a lot of problems we got to fix. And, um, so, we got to do the best we can do to get better. We, we know we're sitting here talking about all the things we got to fix. We got we to fix them. And, uh, you don't label one and fix them. Matt, can you talk about the temple? I think that you lose that about this. Coaching going on during the game. Your coordinators, their coordinators, they're adjusting, you're adjusting. So if something happens in the fourth quarter, have they found something? And if, if they found something that will allow them to be successful, is it your coaching <coughs> job to kind of that adjustment? Is that, does that go on all the time during the game? Yeah. Yeah, it's constant. That's why the quarter coordinators will come here and answer those questions for you. I hear it all, I talk to them, I give suggestions. Uh, uh, but I think that, uh, uh, especially defensively, we've adjusted so well all year. Um, and then we obviously didn't get it done in the fourth quarter of Saturday night. We adjusted well in the third quarter. Uh, but we, we just didn't get things done like we needed to. So that's... Were, were people in the wrong position of was it fatigue that you could see from the, at this point? Gene will be here in just a minute. That's his job, is to tell you. We've gone over all this together. We've talked about it for hours. Uh, if we want the coordinators to keep coming down, I don't need to tell you what they're going to say. Seth you your most experienced player based on defense. I think he said after the game, it felt like we didn't know what we were doing defensively as a head coach. How do you take those kind of comments in terms of dealing with the staff and making sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, I don't listen to anybody after a game because I'm so spent and disappointed, and especially a, a 21-year-old that's so disappointed. Um, they're going to say disappointing things for them, and I, I don't blame them. I felt the same way. Losing's hard, man. Fans think losing's hard. You ought to spend every day of your life trying to prepare to win, and you ought to spend every day lifting weights and every day running to, to get to where you want and then lose in the last minutes. It's really hard. And then have to come and talk to you all and all of our fans. It's, uh, uh, people can't even imagine how hard that is unless they've ever done it. One of the themes of the first six games was how defensively they made a lot of adjustments. The communication between Gene and the kids was there. Case in point, the third quarter against Miami. As the head coach, are you a little bit surprised that maybe some of those adjustments haven't occurred in the last two games defensively? I thought we adjusted really well at halftime. This week we had our best third quarter probably of the year. Um, what we didn't do is they ran the ball and we didn't stop it in the fourth quarter. Was that uh, players that weren't doing what they were supposed to? Is it players not knowing what to do? Was it poor coaching? Uh, that's where it gets confusing. And I always put it on the coaches, period. But everybody's responsible to step up. Players are responsible too. You got to let them on the field on defense. You can only put them in so many places. I, I got to ask, uh, did you sleep much the other night? Because you looked a little different after the loss than what we've seen you other times. Maybe, I, I don't know what that might be. I'm just kind of curious what your evening was like when you got on the plane, got home, how you kind of went through all that. I did the same thing I do after every game. Uh, except this time, when it's the away game, I graded the video on the plane. I got home at uh, 
Uh, I sat up and watched it till probably nine again. Um, try to get an hour or two sleep and then come over here and start answering all the questions you all are asking me. And that's what we do with the staff. We spend an hour and a half with them and we have to go talk to the players. Uh, and then we have meetings for about three hours to look at every play and try to decide what worked and what should have been done differently, what adjustments we should have made that we didn't make. E everything you're asking me, we talk about for hours. And then why didn't we make them? Why were we behind? Why, why didn't we do a better job coaching? Uh, why didn't we score in the fourth quarter more? Why didn't we score on the last two drives in, in the Virginia game and the, the uh, uh, Georgia Tech game? And we've done that around here. And we got a great offense, so why aren't we scoring at the end? I understand if it's a four-minute offense. Uh, we haven't done that very well, but these weren't. These were behind where we should have come up and, and, and caught. Everybody's talking about defense. Offense is at fault, too. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's there, and I have to look at everything. I can't just look at, at one side. Um, but we were on the field too much. Um, we didn't get stops. They ran the ball way too well. Maybe the, uh, the best I've ever seen somebody run the ball against us in a quarter, and that's unacceptable and awful. Um, should we have adjusted better? Yes. Should we have tackled better? Yes. Should we have been in gaps better? Yes. Um, so um, it's awful. So everybody's responsible. Mac, when you, I remember you telling us, you know, with Sam, you know, you felt like it would be his last year as it was his last year. And, and you know, you felt like the home day games coming down the stretch would be his final home games. And, you know, you're saying the same thing with Drake. Like, when you have a quarterback like this, which you've had two times now, when you get to this part, part of the year, do you talk to them about, hey, you know, these are probably your final games in a UNC uniform? Do you go, like, speak to them about that and, I don't know, try to make sure they're cognizant of it to, to savor whatever is left or anything like that? Nope. I tell the players, you never know how many games you got left. Uh, you never, if you get hurt, you may not have any games left. Uh, so I tell them, you better get ready to play every week and you better enjoy the moment every week. I've never done that well. Uh, you ask me how I look and feel after a game, I feel um, like I've let everybody down. I'm miserable after a loss. I'm usually mad after wins because I'm thinking about all the things that we could have done better that could have gotten us to lose. Uh, but that's my personality. I, I got that. So I'm, I'm never happy after games normally um, because I'm trying to figure out I need to get to a video to see what I thought happened and what really happened because sometimes you miss it. Um, and that's why I quit talking about how a player played. Um, because I want to see it. Uh, if, if you see a bad play, you may think a player played a bad game. He might have played a great game and had two bad plays, and they were obvious, and, and, and that really hurt us. But you, you shouldn't talk about his efforts. You can talk about his execution on those two plays. Uh, but you, this, is, this is really important to me. So I'm spent after the game anyway. If we lose, I'm, I'm crushed. I'm absolutely crushed. Um, but do I have to pick everybody up and go back to work? Yeah, they're all looking at me. So if I walk in like the large majority of people after losses and say, this stinks, this stinks, we're awful, uh, coaches were bad, you guys were bad, this was terrible, this was terrible, we're going to lose the rest of the games, so everybody looks at me and says, well, he's through, man, we're, we're out of here. So i got to pick him up. Uh, and my job, Coach Dooley, Vince Dooley told me this when, um, when he was retiring playing Michigan State in the, the uh, Gator Bowl. Uh, I asked him what you have to do to be a great young head coach, and he said, you have to take negatives and turn them into positives. You got 120 people, you're responsible for a whole a fan base, you're responsible for media, you're responsible to an administration, you're responsible to all the high school coaches, all the parents, so you have a load, man. And you're gonna have really bad stuff happen every day. And if you don't take those negatives and turn them into positives, you will never make it as a head coach. And that's my job. Are there negatives in this game? Yeah, some of you all didn't notice. I see them all. Um, do I have to take the negatives and turn them into positives? Yes. Are those very hard conversations? Yes. Very direct and very hard. Uncomfortable? It doesn't matter. I don't, I don't care about who I make mad. Uh, it's not part of my, my job description to keep everybody happy. And when you lose, you're not going to be happy. Uh, but do I have to get upbeat and positive and take a bunch of 18 to 21 year olds and get them back and, and headed in the right direction and get them excited about playing this weekend? Absolutely. 
That's my job. I can't sit around and bitch all week about stuff that people are griping about. I gotta fix things, be positive, and move forward. And that's my job. And that's one thing I'm good at, it's one thing I like. And my job is to have a great practice in the morning, stop the run better, try to figure out why offensively our one minutes haven't been as good at the end of the game, get our punting fixed, um, do, do a better job with our, our field goals, um, got all those marked down, got to get after them in the morning, have a huge practice in the morning, and, and try to get better for, for an exciting finish in November, better than we did last year. That's my job. With, um, with, with Doc Chapman having the explosive plays that he had, you mentioned him a little bit earlier, uh, right now with Nate and Tez kind of being banged up, how do you see him kind of taking on maybe a bigger kind of role in that offense just with the, you know, the injury situation? Yeah, Jeremiah, last year, Doc was dropping all the balls. He just wasn't catching. We couldn't figure it out. We got him some contacts, and that helped. Um, very honestly, <laughs> it, it did. Uh, fair. Daz yeah, Daz is right. the same way. Daz is dropping balls. We got him contacts. So that's the first go-to. <laughs> it's hard to teach somebody to catch who can't catch. But we said, get you, let's get some contacts for you, man. And now he's catching the ball a lot better in practice. In fact, three weeks ago, Lonnie Galloway and I said, you know, we need to play him more. And then he dropped three straight balls. And it, it was like he hurt us. And, and we said, I said, Lonnie said, I got you. Don't, let's don't worry about it this week. We're not ready for that. Uh, but when Nate got hurt, we, we thought we'll use um, um, Bryson Nesbitt more. And we did. He, he's taken a, a bigger role. Uh, but at the same time, um, when Doc went in, he, he produced. So uh, we, we, we're ready to play now. We're, we're ready to put him in the rotation and, and let him go. He's real fast, uh, which was obvious on the kickoff return, too. Uh, but he's getting confidence, and, and sometimes it just takes uh, a, a player more. He was more of a running back slot guy in high school, so he carried it more than he caught it. Uh, but he's, he's really responding, so yes, I think we'd see him play more. Was that the biggest thing for him, just real quick, was that the biggest thing for him, the, you know, the catching? I know you mentioned the contact and everything, but was – the, the catching aspect, was that kind of the biggest hurdle for him to get Absolutely. Him? And I mean, he's, he's made a 100-degree um, turnaround from, from where he was. He was just dropping a bunch of balls, and we were just so frustrated because we love the kid, and he's real fast. And, and now that he's got more confidence catching, and, and then your quarterback's got to have confidence in him, too. Can, can I follow up on that? The, the catch you made last week, the one going backwards, I mean, that was a really difficult ball to track and to catch. and. Corral. How much did that little moment help his confidence? I would think with a young guy like him, something like that would just shoot up. Yeah. You think about all of us. There, there's a lack of confidence is a disease in our society. And, and a lot of people hide it. But there aren't many, near as many people confident as some act like they are. So here you've got these guys that want to play so badly and they want to please so badly. And they're highly publicized and they're highly recruited. And then they get here and they don't play well. And then everybody's asking, why aren't they playing? And we have to be careful because you don't want to talk bad about a young guy and him feel worse. Uh, so it takes sometimes like that play as a moment to say, you know, I got this thing. I can play. I can catch in a game that matters. Um, and, and with Nate being hurt as much as he's been, then we need Doc to step up. So this, is, uh, this should be a great confidence boost for him. And then you've got to make sure that you don't get comfortable. And, and go back and not have the same concentration. So everything we do is to try to make somebody better and, and keep them going this way. And, and that's what we've got to we, we've got to make sure we get done this week. Mac, when when Tess took that big hit uh, late in the game, obviously we know he's okay now. But I mean, you see him go off like that after staying down for a while. How? Because I mean, the game wasn't over at that point. So how hard was it to? mentally detach yourself from that situation and go back to a live game? Well, I can do it because I, I go to every hurt player if they lay there very long because I want to make sure they're okay and normally they'll talk to me. So if they're not talking to the doctors or the trainers, I'm around them more than the doctors or trainers. So when I got to Tez and I said, are you okay? His eyes opened and he said yes. And, and they moved his feet and they moved his hands. So from a quote, parent, father figure, I know he's okay. I don't know if there's something hurt internally, but I know he's not paralyzed. I know he can move. I know he's talking, um, so I'm good. 
I know he's not going to play anymore in the game. Um, so, uh, but my deal then is to try to show our players and if families watching that he's okay without making a big to do about it. So I told the players, we're good. We're good. Go, go back and get ready to go. And then the, smartly they kept him in the hospital just to make sure that everything was okay because uh, it was a, a tough hit. Mac, yeah, I was actually going to ask you about Tez. Like, so when he gets back here yesterday, obviously, like what, I, I know you have to check on him at some point between then and now, like what, what have your interactions been with like him? How does he seem? Like what, what did you tell him? Just what was it like when you saw him for the first time once he got back yeah. here? I did not see him yesterday because he didn't sleep at all. He was up all night in the hospital. So when he got back on the plane, we sent him to his place to sleep. Made sure the trainers and doctors checked him out. So I haven't seen him yet. Uh, because they, I mean, Lonnie said, he's exhausted. And I said, tell him to go to bed. And, and we'll see him tomorrow. So we'll see him today. And Lonnie's talked to him and we took him dinner so he wouldn't have to get out. Um, in fact, uh, um, Gavin Blackwell is his roommate. He took him to his dinner. As I said, let's make sure who's got Tez taken care of. And Gavin says, I got it. So um, Amber Reinstein, our, our uh, nutritionist, figured out what he needed to be eating, made him a good plate, and Gavin took it to him. So, uh, and everybody's checking on him. As soon as we heard, I, um, I heard from Jeremy uh, after the game, he was okay, but going to the hospital. When I talked to you all, I didn't know he was going to the hospital. Uh, even then, and that's what I, I learned with uh, Octavius Barnes in the Carquest Bowl. Uh, he had an awful knee in injury, and the TV reporter came over and interviewed him on the sideline, and he was crying, and he or the doctor, somebody said, he's through. He's ruined his knee, and it really upset his family because they weren't there, and they couldn't take care of him, and at that point, I said, we will never ever talk about an injury again until we have all family members caught up to date on exactly what happened before we, we tell you guys. Uh, or, and that's, we don't let, uh, we take them in immediately if somebody's hurt bad, and we, we do not let TV cameras get around on the sideline, because that's not, that's not fair to parents to see their son sitting there. Um, and he was just told that he's out for the year. Um, or the next year possibly, and here he is a pro prospect. Uh, so you, that, that's why we're very, very cautious uh, with someone afterwards. Uh, I tell them not to tell me during the game. All they tell me, because I'm emotional and I don't want to be told the guy's out for the year, uh, and they may not know for sure, sometimes doctors are human and they'll tell you it looks bad, he's out for the year, I think, and then he's not. Uh, so I said, all I want to know and all I want our players and coaches to know is he out for the rest of the game? That, that's all we ask and that's what they tell us so we'll know that he's not available for the rest of the game. And one of the things that, that hurts you, you see 12 on the field or 10 on the field sometimes in special teams, it's because a young one will get hurt and then he has to go to the trainers and doctors. So Brian Hess is responsible for telling every coach that he's involved with special teams and the regular position that he's out and unavailable. And then sometimes they'll say, okay, he's ready to go back in. And all the information in time doesn't get to the right coach. And he goes back in and nobody's told his replacement that he's out. And that's how you get 12 on the field right quick. Was, was Tez his parents at the game? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. I'll talk to you after. Yeah. Do you try to communicate with them quickly and let them know? Absolutely. Them them. Yes, yes, we called immediately to, uh, I think, talk to dad, maybe high school coach immediately, you gotta figure out who you can find. Right. And, and we try to keep contacts on everybody. So, but that's really important for us. And that's the management of the game. You, and then as Michael said, then I gotta go back after I know he's okay, I gotta go back and try to get back in the, the game and try to figure out how to win a game. And what do you do without him in there? And it's just a fumble. So then we got, uh, we got our timeouts left, but we got to stop them. We had to stop the run, so what do we do to stop them? And then how much time we're going to have left? And we'll have to have one minute offense because we're going to be out of timeouts regardless. Um, when can they take a knee? Uh, all those things are going through your mind, and, and, and at the end of the game, trying to figure out how, how you can make something happen. Mac, it, uh, years ago, 
years ago when he was getting into coaching, it seemed like Mike Minner was like really adamant about it. And he was transitioning from playing to, to what he's doing now. I mean, he was all over the place politics for jobs. Um, I was just wondering if, if, and maybe not, if, like, if he approached you at all with any advice or to help him get started or anything like that. No, I don't know Mike. And I was here when he was at Nebraska, so I never coached against him as a player. Because I, I looked it up, he uh, he went to the Panthers, I think, in 97, 90, 98, something. Or maybe he finished at Nebraska, and he was um, had a great career with the Panthers. And then I think he coached at Liberty and um, and uh, Smith um, yeah. before he went to, to Campbell. But he's, he's done a really good job at Campbell. All right, guys. Thank you, Coach. Thank you.